Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. It's quite thrilling to go back. Actually, I took my PhD here at Oxford, and I used to go to something called the Wolfson Philosophy Society, where people were literally reading papers. I remember that was very difficult for me, because they actually came with a pile of paper and sat for more than an hour in a monotonous voice, reading it out. And I completely lost it. And I always said, why don't you use PowerPoint? And they looked at me as if I was an idiot. But now I'm taking revenge. I'm at Wolfson giving a PowerPoint. Feels very good. My talk is slightly different. Also, you can see from the composition of authors. I mean, of course, there is a smart philosopher at the end, Claire, who has helped me doing some of the thinking for that. But I also have two people who are actually uh, cattle breeders. People who, for, as a living, work on cattle breeding. So, so I got their advice just to because I want to see how practical this was. And Paul Hübel, who is an animal biotechnologist who, who actually works on, DM, uh, on reproductive technologies and DNA editing. So I have a whole team here. And I'm also going, I changed the title, sorry, but I f found a better title and I always like the title should be good. And, and the question is whether, if you're thinking about the issue of hornless cattle, whether DNA editing is the right solution or the best solution. <clears throat> and first I'm going to discuss a bit whether cattle should be hornless. <laughs> because, we, as we already heard from Sarah, they are not by nature. Uh, then whether gene editing is a promising way to achieve honestness, or is, are there other and better ways? And when you compare these different approaches, whether it's ethically acceptable, and then there's a little issue, but actually a very important issue about the law, is it legally allowed? And the last thing that people rarely discuss, but which is really important, will it work in commercial terms? Will it actually hit the market. And that's why I need my cattle breeding friends. But should cattle be hornless? This is an aurochs. It's actually from the National Museum in Copenhagen. It's a reconstructed skeleton. And you can see this bull has huge horns, but also the, the cows would have had horns. So, so aurochs were horned animals. Not that there was the gene for hornless, hornlessness was actually in the species but it wasn't expressed, probably because it gave them a competitive advantage having horns. So that's what we can say from Darwinian reasons, mm -hmm. that the reason they all had horns, even though they had the genetic possibility not to have, was that having these weapons actually gave them an, an advantage in survival. Interestingly, I don't know how often you visit dairy farms, but if you visit a typical dairy farm, you will typically meet this one, the Holstein Friesian, which is a dominant dairy cow in the Western world, and you rarely see Holstein Friesian cows with horns, unless you're biodynamic dairy farms, but apart from some weird organic farms, they all have, have no horns. But actually, these guys naturally grow horns, so something has happened to them. Because in most cases, hornlessness in dairy cattle is an artifact. The reason why this happened was actually until 1960s, they all had horns. Because until the 1960s, the typical way of keeping dairy cattle was in, in, uh, in tight, tight stalls. So they, all the winter, they stood in boxes with a tie on, couldn't move, just get up and lie down. And in the summer, they were in pasture. And that system worked well with horns, because either they were so confined that they couldn't fight, or they were out with so much space that, that they could keep a distance. Then in the 70s and 60s came loose housing system. That's indoor systems where they walk around in a barn. That's the typical system you have for, for dairy cattle today. And with those systems, they had some free space, but not much space. So fighting became a problem. And also worker safety, because there was a risk as a worker in one of these barns. You could be cornered, and suddenly you could be hit by a horn of a cow, which we could be, can be quite dangerous. And today, in Europe and the US, I guess the same rest of the world, for these are places where I can get numbers, about 80% of dairy cows undergo some form of intervention to prevent horns. Smaller number of beef cattle, I'll come back to that, because beef cattle have a higher prevalence of hornlessness, genetic hornlessness. And the state of art, if you're a nice person, I can discuss whether that's nice, but the nicest way you can be as a cattle farmer is, is using what's called this budding. This budding, you, this is the instrument you use. So you have a, a little iron thing that's completely red from heat. Uh, it's used called cautery, the specific system, that they actually burn away the ability to grow a horn on a, on, a, on a calf. 
So young calves, which are not yet the liver holes, the horn buds and the generative tissue are destroyed by means of burning. <coughs> there are other ways, chemical despotting, you put some sort of paste on, but that's really nasty because it's very, very uncertain you can get the right place and that means it will destroy some other tissue. Or dehorning of older animals. My wife is a vet, a practicing vet. I remember when she was <coughs> farmers and couldn't get their act together, then suddenly you have to start taking horns off older cattle and that's really, really nasty and, and hard work. So the, the best way, and I have <laughs> David Miller and other animal welfare researchers work for that, that's probably despotting a cautery. It's done in calves four to 12 uh, weeks old. So you take this glowing thing and put, prior to the burn, you may take, <coughs> take a knife and cut off a layer, and then you burn, and it's, you, it's really unpleasant. I've been doing it myself, Not, I've been standing next by. It smells a bit like when you burn hair. It's a really nasty smell, really unpleasant. About 20 seconds, you keep the thing on, doing the same the other side. side. <coughs> And that, of course, as you can imagine, has some welfare effects. Without anesthesia or pain relief, the intervention is extremely painful. Strong acute pain followed by more moderate pain for about eight hours. <clears throat> and then there may be some long-term pain, which is not well understood. I looked at the literature. They all think there's something, but they haven't been able to quantify it. So there's also an element of something that hasn't been quantified, but probably believed to be there. If you're a nice, very nice guy, if you live in Denmark, for example, and a, a cattle farmer, you actually be acquired, required by law to use uh, local anesthesia prior to this plotting. So you will inject an anesthetic prior to doing that. And these days it's also seen as good practice to acquire non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which means that the, the animals will be covered for about eight hours. And from, from the literature you can read, that with that you can take away sort of all the bad pain, but there will still be a problem about the long-term pain. But all the immediate pain and the severe pain for the first hours will, will be taken away, and, and I think at least civilized countries should at least have legislation in place requiring these things. But then you could ask, shouldn't cows have horns? This is a guy from Switzerland, I mean, Kapol, he actually organized a campaign, you know, in Switzerland you can have referendums not only about whether to leave the EU, they can't leave the EU because they are not in there, but uh, but you can have referendums about a lot of things. And actually this guy made, uh, made it that they had a referendum about whether the, whether about dehorning of cattle in Switzerland. His suggestion was not to ban dehorning, but rather giving an economic incentive, giving money to people who didn't dehorn. Because if you have cattle in systems where they have horns, you need more space and they're more costly. So the idea was making it economically feasible to have <laughs> horned cattle. He lost the vote, but just shows that there is some popular movement towards it. And even people who work on animal welfare research, a uh, famous German uh, animal welfare researcher called Uwe Knierum, has written a paper where she argues actually this is bad because she thinks that horns play a role in social behavior of cattle and say that this budding is a mere symptomatic measure to adjust them, I mean the cows, to husbandry conditions that are insufficiently adapted to the species specific needs of cattle. So you have, we can have a debate about whether they shouldn't have horns. And I agree on that debate, but this is not my focus because I'm going to narrow my question now, and I'll, I'm going to do that twice. It'll be slightly irritating to some of you, but I'm just saying, asking a question of the following sort. Okay, there is a debate to be had, but the rest of the talk, the question we will ask is, if we want all this cows, what is the best way of doing it? So ask and say, okay, we live in a world where for a long while we will have to have cows without horns. What is the best way of achieving that? Does that make sense? So, and this is, by the way, I mean, some of the biodynamics people, they have horns, but to avoid the problems, then they can, you can glue these things on the, on the horn tips, so they're less dangerous. That could be another solution. So the question I'm going to ask is whether gene editing is a promising way to achieve hornlessness, a promising alternative to this rather brutal way you just described. Firstly, as I said, potentness. Potentness is a technical term for having a genetic disposition not to grow horns, that's actually a naturally occurring genotype. Some cattle are born without the disposition to grow horns. This is actually a beef cow from US of a breed called Amerifax. And these Amerifax cows typically don't have horns, they're born without horns. It, the genetic disposition naturally occurs among domestic cattle. In cattle horns are inherited by, by an autosomal recessive gene for potness, which is dominant. That means a bull carrying two copies of the gene for potness will give cold offspring. 
So that's a clear genetic. We know exactly how the genes work. Uh, and here it is. Either they have one gene, uh, this is called the P gene, then half of the calves will be the uh, be both. If they have a double gene, then all the offspring of those bulls. So if you have a, you know, the, the way cattle breeding is organized is that you have a, a, a bull station. So if, you have, if all the elite bulls are polled, all the offspring will be polled. It doesn't matter what the cows are like because poldness is a dominant gene. So if all the all the bulls used for breeding are PP, then all the offspring will be polled. Interestingly, there is actually, and that's where my, my friends in the genomic business uh, or, uh, or sort of the breeding business come in, they notice a growing demand. A lot of farmers in Denmark, say, or Sweden or Norway, where this company works, could we please, please have some bulls that will give homeless cattle? But it's strangely not, not an economic incentive. They, they measure it, it costs about seven euros. I mean, to, to disbot a cattle calf costs about seven euros. That's not a lot. So that will never pay for, for the breed, change of breeding goals. I think the main reason may be ethical, but maybe probably rather is a dirty job. As I said, I've been out with my wife dehorning. It's really unpleasant. It smells badly. You feel like a horrible person. And a lot of farmers don't like to do it. So there is a demand. But as I'm going to argue a bit later, if you're going to use traditional breeding methods, that's a long way to go in, in dairy breed, not in Beef breed, but in dairy breeds, there's actually a long way to go. And that's where gene editing comes in. Why can't we just then use gene editing to make this move a bit faster? And as a matter of fact, as this was, was Sarah showed, there was actually in a paper in Nature Biotechnology where a group of researchers, some of them coming from a company called Recompi Genetics, and some of them coming from UC Davis, together published a paper showing that they succeeded in doing exactly that. So they actually produced two bull calves, Spotty Guy and Dury. So these here are the two sweet guys. Uh, and they actually, with one of them showed, they got offspring and all the offspring was, was polled. So they actually they, they proved it. They actually had two bulls on the ground. One they slaughtered to, to me measure its tissue. The other one they used for experimental breeding. They, they, for reasons I'm going to talk about later, they couldn't get them into the food chain but they actually managed to show it worked. And, and one of the reasons why it works in cattle and will not work in chicken, for example, or fish or pigs, is that cattle already use a lot of uh, uh, reproductive technologies, which is necessary. Now I'm going to show you a bit about technology. So how do you do this? There are two ways, two routes. The guys who did, who did the original one, they actually took the long route. They took out cells, fibroblasts, and then you do the gene editing on the fibroblasts, and afterwards you clean the cells, because if you do gene editing on, on a cell line, they will not all be, be genetically modified, but then you can sort of select them, and before, when you have a pure cell line, you can use the same technique they used for the sheep, used for the sheep body, so they can take an egg out of a cow, take out the nucleus, add one of the cells, and do the little trick that it will dolly, and turn it into a fetus, and then they can do embryo transfer. I think that's a very costly way. That's why my friends say that will be really, really expensive. That's an easier way. That's using, uh, taking out unfertilized eggs. They already do that even on very young heifers. You know, the problems with, with cattle breeding is that it takes several years. Generation interval is very long, unlike the chicken or the fish. Long generation intervals. So to speed it up, they have now methods where they can take out uh, eggs, unfertilized eggs from very young heifers, so they can, on the female side. They can do in vitro fertilization. And then they can do, do the gene editing directly on the fertilized egg, which is in many ways much easier. And what they can do afterwards is then they can grow these eggs and then they can do pre-implementation uh, uh, biopsies. They can take out a little, little bunch of cells and they can not only measure whether the gene has been inserted, but they can also measure the breeding value. You have something called genomic selection. So there are a lot of reasons why you, you like to do that anyway, and then you can add them. So there are these two routes by means of which you can do this, two biotechnological routes. And, and as I said, the reason why this is going to work in practice is that a lot of this, apart from the gene editing part, all of this is already happening. I mean, the reason why I work with Paul Lutl is we have, he has a project. I'm just the ethics guy who, who does all the ethics irritating stuff on the side uh, and social science stuff on the side. But they actually do these things already, and it's becoming routine in, in, the, in both in Europe and the United States to do these things. So this gene editing is just a little add-on 
to a bunch of things you already do in dairy cattle. So this is a quotation from from the guys who pop in the Nature paper, Nature Biotechnology paper, say, although Spotty Guy and Bury could serve as founders for dissemination of polar genetics into the dairy industry, they also represent a proof that integration of this polar gene into the elite animals could be used to eliminate the need for dehorning. And, and by the way, Marin asked me a while ago, it's just a simple gene, it's one gene. It's also one of these very nice properties, you just have one gene and you add it, okay, you're done. This solution to the dehorning problem would be economically viable and would potentially improve the welfare of cattle in the United States. Wow. And they actually made it to one of the daughters of a brewery, actually made it to the front page of a journal called Wired. I've been told that's big in the US. So to get on the front page of Wired is nice. So that beautiful pole, pole the heifer got in there. And there was a story, a more humane livestock industry brought to you by CRISPR. By the way, they didn't use CRISPR. They used something called Talon. If you're a bit into the nerdy stuff, Talon was a predecessor of CRISPR. But today, I think they use CRISPR Cas9. Talon was a state of the art in, in the in the mid 90s, where, mid 20s, where they saw them in around 2015 when they did this stuff. Today, you you use CRISPR Cas9. So Talon is just a predecessor of CRISPR, as I understand it. Okay, that done. Then comes the question: Is that ethically and legally acceptable. And now I'm going to annoy you again because I'm going to narrow the context. So we already decided not to discuss whether ethically speaking cattle should have horns. And also we will not here discuss the existing application of reproductive technologies. I mean, all the things you saw, you can also discuss that, but that's not my focus. My focus will be about the adding the gene editing part to something that you already do in the cattle industry. And the ethics part, I think we have found four things to discuss. Is this natural? Will it display respect for animal integrity? Will it be compatible with concern for animal welfare? And will it look after human health and safety? Naturalness. Well, gene edited polled cattle are natural in a very trivial sense that as a group they would not have existed but for human intervention. But this they have in common with all other domestic animals. I mean, there would be no German shepherds. There would be no giant uh, 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 rabbits. There would be no, no, no broiler chicken if it wasn't for, for human intervention, as, as Marin said ago, a while ago. So that doesn't distinguish them. And unlike with the transgenic case that Sarah talked about, these, uh, these genes are already found in the gene pool. So it's actually not bringing something into the species that didn't, didn't exist in advance. It's just making a more rapid route to something that could naturally happen. And based on that, I think it's difficult to argue that in, in terms of the genes they carry, these cows are significantly more unnatural than other modern cattle. Because as you see, naturalness comes in degrees. If you're against anything unnatural, you should be against any sort of domestication. But it's very difficult to argue that something specifically more unnatural about these animals. Then there could be the concern for the integrity of the animals. I mean, integrity is often used to say that we should respect individual animals, including their bodies, and not alter them to better suit human purposes. But the whole point here is that, that we are not altering an animal, we are creating an animal. The whole point is that when Spotty Guy and, and Brewery were made, it's not as if you took an, an existing animal and changed it. You created an animal with a certain property. So you could not, cannot say that there's an individual animal whose integrity has been harmed. Unlike all the calves, which have been despotted. I mean, you could say you did something really horrible to them. So no individual is not being respected. Then you could talk, and some people like to talk about, uh, about the in, uh, in integrity of the whole species. But as a, my point is that in terms of species, these genes could spread anyway. I mean, they're already found in the species. If you had enough time, enough money, you could do it naturally. So even from a species point of view, it's difficult to say that you have actually violated that species. A bit unlike the blind chicken case where, of course, it, it, by the way, actually the experiment with the blind chickens were naturally occurring, but forgetting about that, if you introduce that change in, into the animals that would not occur naturally, then you could say that you violated the integrity of the species, but you cannot say that here. Then, <coughs> Then comes the concerns for animal welfare. At first sight, 
you could say, well, that's fantastic because you don't dehorn, you don't debut this butt, so you actually do, you, you avoid some horrible things. But it's important to you know be be, be, be aware that, that there are some welfare problems. I mean, if you read the paper by Carlson et al. that I referred to for nature biotechnology, it took them 26 embryos to get two offspring. And that means on the way there were a number of miscarriages, which we often have with this kind of... I mean, as soon as you use in vitro fertilization, because people, are the, the scientists are getting better and better, but there are still things they don't understand perfectly, so cloning, particularly also with cloning, there are things that are not well understood, and you get a number of malformed animals that, that are being aborted late in pregnancy. I happen to think, for, for reasons I would love to talk about if you're interested, that the fetuses don't have, are not sentient, so I don't think they have a problem. But I do think that the cows involve cows, of course. If, if you're a cow which has a late abortion, of course that cow will have a welfare problem. So there are some welfare problems. On top of that, there could be what's called deleterious non-target effects. That means that people do this in a less than perfect way and as a consequence get, get some really unpleasant side effects. And that in a way links up with the, with the other concern, concern for human health and safety. Technically speaking, these days gene editing is a form of genetic modification. In principle, this is no different, as I said, from what you'd expect from in nature. But in practice, things may not go as expected. And tragically, this was actually the case. They wrote this wonderful piece saying everything is under control. There were very, a lot of hoopers that were saying, oh, get at us. We, we, we have tested everything. And then, unfortunately, a scientist at, at FDA found something they hadn't found. They found a bit of. So they, they claimed in the original paper this is completely free of off target effects, but sub subsequently at FDA, a scientist in Burris genome found a stretch of bacterial DNA, including a gene conferring antibiotic resistance. I've talked to several people about it. It doesn't seem to be a big hazard. It's not the case that this will sort of kill anyone or cause trouble, but it just shows that there's, a, there's always the danger that you don't understand, fully understand what you're doing. You may do things inadvertently, despite all your perfection, that will cause trouble further down the line. So that calls for precaution. And that's where, in real life, the actual limitation is right now. You may know that the Swedes, normally they're very precautious, but they were quite brave here. They tried to put through legislation saying that gene editing is not a transgenic form of transgenesis, but they were hit by the decision of the European Court of Justice, I think that was Sarah who mentioned that, which actually said, sorry, it falls under the GMO directive. And that means that a gene edited cow will be seen as a GMO, and that means that you have to do very extensive safety testing, which means that it will be forbiddingly expensive to bring it into the food chain, because before you, when you're finished with doing all that, first the cow will be dead, secondly you, you have used the body 100 times. Then you would expect the Americans, particularly with the current president, to be much more brave, but that's not the case. Uh, Actually, the FDA has ruled that, uh, and I was supposed to look at Claire when I talk about the Americans, but I forgot that Claire, sorry. No, you don't know what Claire is a Brit, who just happens to live in the US. Uh, uh, FDA actually has ruled that ma there is mandatory pre market new animal drug regulatory abbreviation. That means, in ordinary language, that you have to test them as if they were drugs. And that's very, very expensive, it's a similar thing as in Europe. Whereas the U US regulatory authorities are very lenient on plants, they actually are as stringent on animals as the US are. So, for the time being, this is not going to happen. Unless someone changes that these laws, there will be no gene-edited cattle on the ground because that would be far too expensive, full stop. So now I have to become a bit hypothetical. Okay, assuming that someone changed those laws, would it then be interesting from an economic or would it be acceptable? I mean, one question is whether is the world ready for gene editing cattle? There's always this concern about new technology. Uh, here you see some, some Stone Age imagination, someone inventing the wheel. So, no wheels here, we, we don't want that. And even, even if the technology is superior by technical standards, it must still be meat resistant from key stakeholders. We have a lot of the technologies in the food, food area that have been rejected by the popular, popular I mean, Various ways of decontaminating food has been rejected, even though they may be quite safe. I mean, radiation, food radiation, for example, is something that all the experts I know think is brilliant, but it's not allowed. 
And we don't know whether the public will accept it. We know that in some other cases with the cloning, there was a big debate when, when they started cloning uh, uh, cows in the US and they started exporting to Europe. There was a reaction both in the US and Europe. People didn't want milk from cloned cows. You may remember that debate. But it's very unclear whether it will make a difference that the cows producing milk for the market are not themselves genetically. Just like, actually, a lot of the cows, we, I mean, today, all the cows you meet will probably somewhere be related to a cloned cow. People don't care about that. They're, they're, for some funny reason, they only care about the, the actual cow giving the milk. So we don't know that. So it remains an open question whether the technology will be acceptable by the market. What we know much more about is what I'm going to talk about now, whether it will work economically. Will it be feasible? for a breeding company, for my friends in Viking Genetics. And, yes, that's a, a really interesting part. Now I'm going to tell you a bit about breeding. This is a figure, you only look at the striped ones. These are, these are sort of uh, genetic merit. That sort of is what you, what you sort of get out in terms of dollars of a certain genotype. And you can see the horned ones, you get nearly $800. The super potent ones, just naturally occurring, you get $620. So there's a difference about $170. That doesn't sound like a lot, but I have to tell you that's astronomic. Because if you actually choose tomorrow to only use those bulls, that means that for, for once you would take a loss of 120, and for every generation that will be added on with interest and interest and interest. And that, I have to tell you, is going to be billions of dollars. Be very, very expensive. Because as soon as you, you have a cumulative effect of going back in terms of breeding, it costs a lot of money. And that was actually, my, my friends in the breeding company, they thought, this, wow, this is a piece of cake. But that was convinced them, no, wow, that means that even though our farmers want whole cattle, we're not going to do it because the loss in breeding value will be such. So unless they can find a smart way of using other technologies to get beyond that, they will, that this will not happen. And also the other problem is inbreeding. I mean, if you work in cattle breeding, you're concerned about two things, genetic progress and avoiding inbreeding, because inbreeding is something that's a risk of trouble later on in your life. So for both those reasons, they actually ended up in our discussion with thinking, no, this is not realistic. We are not, in a foreseeable future, going to use traditional breeding of potness in, in Holstein Friesian because it will cost too much in lost breeding value. And I have a figure here showing that. It's a very complicated one, but the important thing is A, B, and C, and D are ways where you sort of just use traditional breeding. A is where you don't, uh, and all the, the light ones means that there's no potness, the half light ones means there's a single gene, and, and the very dark ones means that, that you have double gene. And you can see here, and, 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 and these curves means how much genetic value. And you can see, to get maximum genetic value, you will have no, no polled animals. Then you may move, may move to a scenario where you get a certain amount, but then you can see there's a loss. So as soon as you start breeding to get more potentness into the species, you will have a genetic loss. And that means loss of money that's accumulated and turns into an astronomic sum of money. But if you're allowed to use gene editing like in this one, you end up with the same level of economic income and to totally put animals. So what this figure shows is that providing the gene editing works and providing there's no legal obstacles, you can actually make a lot of money by using it. Because you can get the desired quality of being gene edited without facing the loss in, 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 in genetic progress. So that's the argument why my friends at Viking Genetics think this is a fantastic application, as long as it doesn't face consumer problems and as long as the lawyers, the legal people, currently change the law. They haven't done that yet. And interestingly enough, what's also interesting about this, this one shows that the black ones here are the gene editors you need to get. And what happens is that after about nine years, they will die out. So gene edited animals will only be required for a short while. Then they will do their job, go out of business. And that means that that, uh, that gene editing will no longer be necessary to maintain the, the breed. And I think that would, would mean something to the public, that you do something for a while, but you don't have to go on and modify these animals. And the modified animals themselves, they will die out. So, my conclusions are, are our conclusions. Wild cattle and horns, because these give them a competitive advantage. However, a normal production system, a normal, that's what we have had in the Western world since the 60s, 
uh, cars will suffer from higher levels of injury if they have horns. The normal way of getting rid of the horns through despotic gives rise to welfare problems, even with the best of systems, with, with painkillers and things like that. And the alternative route to hornless is by breeding animals which carry the naturally occurring gene for potentness. However, for dairy breeds, the cost of doing this with a short time horizon would be astronomical. That's not going to happen. So gene editing appears to be a viable tool to speed up the, without these costs. So that's a real life application that will make a difference, both for animal welfare and economics. And provided perfection of technology, and, and I think Unlike Claire's case, we're not that far. I think they used an earlier technology, Talon. I think those of you who, who do these things will, will testify to, I hope, that this is moving very, very quickly. So the idea that you could do this in an OK way and, and not run into the trouble that the guys did in the, 19, the 2016 paper is likely. So, so there seems to be a really good case, provided that the law is, is uh, provided that, that these re regulatory impediments are, are no longer there. Okay, folks, that was my argument. <laughs>